happy to have Joseph Gerson with us uh, this evening. He is the director of the Peace and Security Program of American Friends Service Committee. He's the chair of the No to War, No to NATO uh, Committee. Um, he is the author of four books about the American global military presence and nuclear policy. The most recent one uh, being Empire and the Bomb, How the U.S. Uses Nuclear Weapons to Dominate the World. I want to say a few words about NATO as a nuclear alliance. And again, there's more to it than, than meets the eye. Um, the U.S. had nuclear weapons you know, in, in, in Europe from early on. Uh, we used our nuclear threat uh, during the two uh, Berlin uh, crises. Uh, but one of the concerns, uh, especially with de Gaulle, uh, was, was a fear of what was called decoupling, uh, that Western Europe might decide it was not entirely in its interest uh, to hold so tight with the United States. Uh, and so to help hold them in, and again, we're dealing with you know, the, the uh, rules of the game among mafia families, uh, basically they created a thing called the, uh, the, 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 the NATO planning group, nuclear planning group. And this integrated European militaries and their, their senior elites into the nuclear planning for Europe. Gave them, if you will, a stake in, in, the, uh, in preparations for the elimination of the human species. Uh, this then was uh, reiterated at the Portugal summit in 2010, uh, where they said that NATO should continue to maintain secure and reliable nuclear forces with widely shared responsibility for deployment and operational support. Uh, the United States maintains uh, nuclear weapons in six of the um, uh, Western European, not only Western European, but European states, Belgium, Germany, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and, five of them, and, and Turkey. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing at the moment, uh, you know, the United States is spending a trillion dollars. I mean, I don't know what a trillion dollars is. Uh, I was talking to my grandson trying to figure out what a billion was. It's a thousand millions, right? Uh, to build a whole new generation of nuclear weapons uh, and their delivery systems, a trillion dollars. Um, and the lead weapon in this is the B-61 11. We already have B-61s, but this is going to be a new and improved B-61 bomb, which is more usable. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, the power of its explosives can be dialed up or down. And within the military, the perception is that this makes it a more usable uh, weapon for the future. Uh, and now we have, in 2016, uh, the Atlantic Council telling us uh, that um, we should be improving NATO's nuclear plans and forces and we should be conducting more realistic nuclear exercises, uh, which is to say increasing the preparations uh, to eliminate the human race. Okay, and then at the center of this in, in, in our history, and many of you will, will recall this, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, one of the questions that had been outstanding was on what terms would Germany be reunited? Uh, and the deal that was brokered between Secretary of State Baker and his principal, George H.W. Bush, on the one hand, and Gorbachev on the other, uh, was that Germany could be reunited on West German terms, but on the condition that NATO did not move a centimeter closer to Moscow. So that was the deal. Uh, Gorbachev did not get it in writing. He had it orally. Uh, and when Bill Clinton came to power, um, uh, he went by the wayside. Uh, and so, as I said before, as you saw on the map, uh, with the exception of Ukraine and Georgia, which are both NATO aspirant countries, uh, we were now really pretty much across Russia's uh, western borders. Um, so again, as Molly was saying, we have the end of the Cold War. And you'll remember there was this pregnant, incredibly pregnant period uh, between the collapse of the Berlin Wall and Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, in which we all wondered what the new world was going to be like, right? Uh, no longer had the rationale uh, for these major military builds up for the aggressive uh, challenges. Uh, and then uh, you'll recall that with the invasion of Kuwait, uh, George H.W. Bush gave us the new world order. Uh, and that, <coughs> that served as the rationale to reinforce U.S. military alliances, U.S. military spending, and we were into this new world. Uh, rather than being retired, uh, NATO was uh, repurposed. 
critical, critical in this period, uh, was the war on Serbia. Now, it was complex, right? I mean, the Serbs were not doing kind things in Kosovo, uh, but I tend to, I tend to uh, follow Noam Chomsky uh, and to say that, well, it wasn't pretty. The mass, the mass humanitarian slaughter in Kosovo didn't really begin until after the U.S. war in, uh, against Serbia began. And in the negotiations leading up to that period, uh, the United States with, uh, with uh, Milosevic, uh, the Serbian ruler, uh, this was a negotiation in, in France, uh, and the United States said, well, we won't attack you if you'll give our forces full reign and full run uh, over Serbia. Well, you know, what kind of leader is going to accept that? It was, it was, it was, a, it was a deal that they absolutely couldn't, couldn't accept. Uh, and so we, we have the war. The war is taken without UN authorization. It was a NATO war. And there's a, a fine scholar at Tufts University, uh, Michael Glennon, uh, who uh, in May of, of 1999 in, in Foreign Affairs uh, wrote that with little discussion and less fanfare, uh, NATO, the, uh, the United States effectively abandoned the old UN charter rules that strictly limit international intervention in local conflicts in favor of a vague new system that is much more tolerant of military intervention, <coughs> but has few hard and fast rules. And so this, in a sense, that war was a fundamental turning point in the way the world works. I think in terms of Afghanistan fought without UN authorization, Kofi Annan and called it an illegal war, uh, the invasion of Iraq, and the, and the list goes on. Okay, then again in, in Liz, the Lisbon summit 2010, they essentially ratified what had already been happening in terms of uh, NATO out of area operations. And again, in our thinking, you know, we think in terms of NATO as just in relationship to Europe and principally in relationship to uh, containing Russia. Not that I think that Russia is particularly expensive at this period of time. Uh, so coming out of that, um, U.S. policy, the NATO, uh, sorry, the Pentagon, uh, its strategic guidance tasked NATO with ensuring control of mineral resources and trade while reinforcing the encirclement of China and Russia. So NATO's role in this period becomes, among other things, securing the oil and the gas for the West. Um, it rationalized the, expedition, uh, the expeditionary missions uh, in, in Europe, including, say, the France and the French in Mali. Uh, Many of us are unaware that, for example, we now have AFRICOM. U.S. forces are very active all across Africa. We're deep into Africa. Uh, and a lot of this is done in conjunction with or shared responsibilities, particularly with the French, but I think in terms of Libya, uh, the French, and, and the British. Um, uh, in terms of drone operations, which are you know, principally uh, in the global south, there are now 15 nations involved in one way or another uh, in those drone operations. Uh, with the Mediterranean dialogue that I mentioned before, uh, you've got collaboration kind of mostly anti-terrorist at this point uh, with, with countries across uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, what's going to happen with the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative uh, with the divisions that are, that are there is you know, sort of a sense of wonderment, uh, but it's there. And of course, you know, we have our global partners as far away as Japan, uh, Pakistan, and, uh, and the Philippines. So, you know, I'm not an authority on, on Central European history. I can't claim to do that or be that. Uh, but in preparing to go to, uh, to Warsaw, I did some reading. Uh, among other things, uh, a demanding read is uh, Mitchner's uh, uh, novel, but history of Poland, uh, beginning with the uh, Tatar invasion of, of Poland. Uh, and what you learn in, in at least the cursory study uh, is the boundaries for which we are ostensibly defending right, have been in constant change for the last 400 years. Uh, if you think in terms of Poland, uh, you're thinking of Poland as having been invaded uh, by the Tatars, uh, by Lithuania. Lithuania once controlled it. Uh, all the way and up and part of part of Ukraine, uh, 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 Germany, um, Sweden. Uh, and, and Russia. Uh, and one of the questions that's there for me is just in terms of kind of the tragedy of, 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 of 
you know, the tragedy really of human history and, and, and human existence is we're at a point where we think about the possibility of nuclear war to defend boundaries that have been changing for the last 400 years. I mean, we need to begin wrapping our, our, our minds around that. And certainly the case is there with, with Ukraine as well. So let me say a bit more about Ukraine, because following on, on the 1999 war in Serbia, Ukraine, Ukraine serves as another turning point. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's a complex situation. Um, one way to, to ground that is to say, when I was in Georgetown, there was this uh, priest, Father Fadner. And, and Father Fadner walked around with the full, excuse me, the full Catholic regalia. He had the big gowns, he had a giant hat, and he lectured like this. He taught us Russian history from a czar's point of view. <laughs> um, he did. And um, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the young Jesuits told me that in the, in the, in the um, Jesuit quarters, he had said that anyone who was a communist should be shot. And, and while I was not a communist, I knew I should get out of his class before he fought me. It was <laughs> a matter of principle. Well, years later, years later, I learned that Father Fadner had been Joe McCarthy's father confessor. Uh, so, but then to understand Father Fadner a little bit, he had been a Jesuit in Ukraine at the time of Stalin's collectivization and had witnessed the mass starvation and deaths of the war. So, as bad as he was, this is, this is part of, of Ukraine's history that we need to acknowledge. On the other hand, uh, we need to remember from a Russian perspective uh, that the origins of, 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 of the Russian state are in Kievian Rus. I mean, they began in Kiev. Uh, to appreciate that Ukraine has long been divided east and west, uh, uh, east Russian Orthodox uh, and west Catholic, uh, east greatly influenced by Russia and aligned with Russia, in the west greatly influenced by Poland and Lithuania. Uh, and these divisions uh, continue to this day. Uh, if you talk to people, you'll find that in, in eastern Ukraine, uh, on the one hand, powerful uh, economic ties to Russia, being deeply integrated into the Russian uh, economy, um, major, major manufacturing uh, and export into Russia. Uh, and also, uh, many, many family ties. I mean, in Ukraine, yeah, where was it? I guess it was, it was both in, in Warsaw and then I was just, uh, in Tokyo at the uh, World Conference Against the NH Bombs. In both cases, there were Russian dissidents there. Uh, and I had this privilege of speaking to them. In both cases, they talked about the deep family connections and Russian families between Ukraine and Russia. Um, so how to make those divisions is, is complicated. Uh, you also have the reality, and even when I was in high school, we had a study about this. Uh, Crimea uh, has been since 1783 Russia's warm water port. Okay, that's an imperialist piece in terms of having access further to the south. Uh, but, you know, we've had Hawaii since a shorter period of time, right, uh, or, or Puerto Rico, uh, and, and is the home of their Black Sea fleet. Uh, then, kind of kicking back the other way, in 1994, uh, there was an agreement uh, that uh, the West and Russia would, quote, respect the independent sovereignty and existing borders of Ukraine. And the reality is that, uh, much like the uh, interventions by many forces in Syria, uh, this is an agreement that's been honored in the breach. Uh, we now have both uh, NATO uh, and uh, Russia uh, engaging in increasingly aggressive military exercises. Uh, so I made reference before to Anaconda, uh, but you know, we're doing major exercises and permanent uh, basing of, of our naval forces in the Black Sea uh, on Russia's southern border. Uh, the Baltics, the Baltics have become a particularly um, uh, sharp focus of, of, of tensions. Uh, we've got the military build up there, more military exercises probably in the Baltics than, than anywhere else. I think a while back, uh, 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 our Vice President went to Iran, uh, Romania and talked about our in, 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 uh, indestructible bonds uh, with the people of Romania. <laughs> um, you can't make this stuff up. Um, but but on, on the other side, in response, the Russians have been trying to signal to us that they're not going to roll over and play dead. Right? 
Uh, so you had, uh, as you see here in the slide on the right, uh, a number of Russian military incursions uh, into the sovereign space of a number of Western nations uh, around Britain, uh, around Sweden, um, and, and around Finland. Uh, so you know, the tensions are, are there, uh, then combined with the, uh, with the military buildup. So then I want to uh, go back to the um, uh, analogy of the, of the years preceding uh, World War I. Uh, in World War I, it may be that the only power that wanted the war was Germany. Uh, certainly in this period, there's no nation that really wants that war. Uh, but uh, as you see from Secretary, former Secretary of Defense Perry is running around the country right now with his hair on fire. I think he's going to be speaking here in New York uh, later uh, in October, October he'll be speaking. Uh, and what he is saying is that the danger of some sort of nuclear catastrophe growing out of some kind of incident or accident is greater now than it was during the Cold War. Um, so let me signal you that it's important to be dealing with the nuclear issue as well as the issues of intervention. And, and then there's a, a, a Michael Clare, who's a, a good friend and a, a fine, fine analyst, um, says, you know, what, what happens in the middle of one of these exercises? You know, I, recently a, a Russian plane was a, a U.S. ship at about 10 feet. Um, and we do the same to them. Uh, what happens in the middle of this if a 22-year-old kid, right, uh, either because he's just pissed uh, or he's scared, uh, hits the button and takes down uh, one of our planes, right, or one of their planes? Uh, you then have the possibility of escalation uh, toward the unthinkable. And the same applies uh, in relationship to, to China. And a number of, of, of very serious people around the world are taking this very seriously. So there's a report that comes out of, um, out of uh, Brookings. Uh, it was a process called uh, Back from the Brink. Um, uh, actually, sorry, the Tribal uh, Cuts Commission. They have a study called Back from the Brink. And, and what they write, this is coming from you know, the lead, lead center of the United States, is in the atmosphere of deep mutual mistrust, the increased intensity of politically hostile military activities in close proximity may result in further dangerous military incidents which may lead to miscalculations and or accidents and spin off in unintended ways. So you didn't hear that from me, you heard that from Brookings. Uh, and then compounding the situation, uh, again, you'll, you'll recall the headlines of the last uh, couple of months. Um, Obama was considering um, uh, ending the US first strike nuclear doctrine. Uh, but then uh, the Pentagon and Kerry and um, uh, Carter, Ash Carter, said, no, you can't do that. Uh, so the United States continues to have its first right doctrine. And this is not just abstract. I mean, since Nagasaki, the United States, during international crises and wars, has prepared and or threatened to initiate nuclear war at least 30 times. Uh, remember that in the negotiations with Iran, all options were on the table. And when a nuclear power says all options are on the table, all options are on the table. So now we have missile defenses. Um, now, the United States long explained that our missile defenses in Europe uh, were there to protect against protect Europe against an attack from Iran. Uh, but then there was the <laughs> nuclear deal with Iran, right? Uh, and that, that rationale disappeared. Uh, what the Russians had been afraid of uh, is that, and the Chinese too, uh, is that uh, missile defenses are really part of a first strike doctrine. Uh, with the idea being that in your first strike, you wipe out most of the enemy's uh, uh, missiles and nuclear weapons. Some of them may survive. Uh, and then you have your missile defenses to take out the surviving uh, enemy missiles. Uh, so the fear from Russia continues to be uh, that uh, we have a first strike uh, uh, doctrine uh, directed against them. Okay, so, so then again, coming back to, uh, to Mali, uh, what's, what's the alternative? And, you know, when, when, the, when the Cold War ended, uh, you know, the, the Reagan people were saying, you know, look, we outspent the Russians, and this is why we won the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. um, the reality is rather more complex. Right? And of course, we know that there were a whole lot of internal contradictions in the Soviet Union. And that was the biggest force that, that took them down. 
But the Cold War actually ended before the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the Cold War ended in 1987 with the negotiation of the Inter Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement. Right? And those of you who were in the Million Person March here on June 12, 1982, people who voted in the referendums across New England and across the country, we pushed Reagan to do the negotiations that he said he would never do. Uh, and in the middle of this crisis, when again we're five minutes to midnight, um, you'll remember that Sweden had this wonderful prime minister, Wolf Palme. Uh, he not only provided a kind of a moral beacon for us during the Vietnam War, but at the height of the crisis, he brought together leading figures from the Soviet Union, from Europe, from the United States, to talk about how we could back away from the spiraling arms race that threatened our survival. And what they came up with was a fairly ancient um, truth, right? Uh, when you take a step that makes me feel insecure, uh, I'm likely to take another step to defend myself or to attack you, which is gonna lead you to go up the spiral the other way, and up we go to, to the air missiles of the time. And so he came up with, a, he and this, this uh, commission uh, came up with the, with the idea of common security. Uh, as uh, Reiner Braun says here, common security means negotiation, dialogue, and cooperation. It implies peaceful resolution of conflicts. Security can only be achieved by joint effort, but not at all. And at heart, the way common security works is that in tough negotiations, not, and not kind of nice, sweet things in peace studies, uh, but, but in hard, realpolitik negotiations, uh, each side names what the other side is doing that it perceives as threatening its security or survival. And then in the negotiations, you explore what can our side do to make the other side feel more secure uh, in, in a way that won't undercut our security. And as those negotiations went forward, uh, you had the, the INF Treaty, uh, which essentially uh, uh, blocked the deployment of the, uh, of the Euro missiles and Pershing and crews on our part and the, and the SS-20s on, on, on the Russian. Uh, and I would argue that this is, the, this is the model that we should be adopting for our foreign policy, foreign and military policy. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not peace, it doesn't, it doesn't end imperialism, uh, but you know, it's the next step that we, we can take. And of course, we want to go beyond that. But I think this is where we can be now. So again, further, what is, what is, the, what, what is the alternative to NATO, right? Uh, again, we were talking uh, before, uh, you know, is NATO, can we get rid of NATO? Well, it's not going to happen quickly. You know, we, we might wish it would, uh, but we're dealing with deeply, uh, deeply vested forces and big power, right? Uh, so the, the clear alternative is to build up uh, the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, it played a major role in, in the period uh, between 75 and the 1980s in uh, creating uh, 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 mutual confidence, uh, monitoring, uh, and, and, and helping to um, uh, calm the situation. Uh, and we now have a situation uh, where we even have OSCE monitors uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, but again, when you go to Europe and you're listening to people talking about what is the alternative, uh, they'll tell you that it's, uh, it's the OSCE. So I made reference before to the, uh, the back from the break. Let me just read through uh, the kind of critical uh, uh, recommendations, and you can find these on the web. Uh, first and foremost, enhancing the role of the OSCE, quote, the single multilateral platform on which dialogue on relevant security concerns can and should be resumed without delay. Second, giving priority to US-Russian negotiations to restrain and address the intense military buildup and military tensions in the Baltic area. Preventing uh, dangerous military incidents by establishing uh, specific rules of conduct and dialogue on nuclear risk reduction measures. Uh, the US and Russia committing to resolve their differences on compliance with the INF uh, treaty and addressing the growing dangers of hypersonic and nuclear weapons. And then last and least, what's the alternative? Uh, we come back to the we're in a hard time, uh, Lord knows, with our uh, two leading presidential candidates, uh, the future does not look bright. 
uh, and, and, but what we need to remember is that the power ultimately lies with the people. Right? Amen. Um, you know, we've been through a number of struggles, whether it's the civil rights struggle, which at least won some progress in kind of ending formal uh, American apartheid, uh, women's movement, Vietnam War movement, the freeze movement. Um, you know, in, in the Philippines, uh, you saw the Etza revolution that overthrew um, uh, Marcos. Uh, you know, those of us who've got gray hair uh, will remember that we wondered if apartheid in South Africa would ever end, uh, and it did on the basis of people's power. So I think we, we need to build it. Uh, I was, I'm glad you're all here. We've got time for questions and where this goes. Uh, but obviously, you know, the next steps lie with you, right? Um, who you're going to, what more are you going to read and learn? Uh, who you're going to talk to? Uh, what kind of activities you're, you're going to organize? Uh, 